It is really good to be in New York. It's really especially good to be among friends at the National Committee, um, partly because the people at the National Committee are the very people who inspired a kind of bookish Qing historian hiding out in Washington to try her hand at being a public intellectual, which you know, I, I, I wondered you know, what need is there for a Qing historian as a public intellectual in Washington. So I was delighted to be chosen. I'm grateful to Jan and Dan and Margot and John and Steve for everything I've learned um, from participating in the National Committee programs. PIP not only taught me about the inner workings of my hometown, um, but it also took me to Chongqing at precisely the moment that Bo Xilai was striking black um, and to the hometown of Deng Xiaoping on the very same bus as his greatest biographer, Ezra Vogel. Um, and thanks to Pip, I was brave enough to say yes when I was invited to talk about Confucius Institutes on public radio, an opportunity that came my way because of K through 12 volunteer outreach that I undertook because of Pip, um, and certainly that I felt more confident approaching because of Pip. Um, but most importantly, thanks to the Pip program, I made a whole bunch of new friends. Um, which is something that one seldom does at middle age. Um, and maybe it wasn't your intention, but one of the most valuable friendships that came about as a result of PIP was a friendship and collaboration with Stephen R. Platt, the author of Autumn in the Heavenly Kingdom, who sort of became my fellow traveler in the wilds of the 19th century, and we exchanged manuscripts and had some incredibly productive conversations about Qing history um, on the road between the State Department and the CIA, you know, um, <laughs> as public intellectuals. We were busy talking about other things. So I'm sorry if, if that wasn't one of the objectives of the programs, but I think my book is a much better one as a result of my participation in PIP. So thanks for picking me. Hmm? And thanks to the Luce Foundation for underwriting the PIP program. Yes, absolutely, um, and for hosting me today. And thank you for the very productive partnership between Luce and the National Committee that um, made the Public Intellectuals Program possible. It was a pleasure, and it still is a pleasure. All right, to get us oriented, when and where, my book is about a war known most often in English as the Taiping Rebellion. Although, as I note in the book, and as I'm going to reiterate today, the very nomenclature that we use to talk about these events in English implies a certain value judgment or a particular position on the war and its combatants. Whereas the terminology used in Chinese today, the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom Revolutionary Movement, implies quite a different perspective, perhaps the opposite standpoint. Both terms assume that there were clearly defined good guys and bad guys, differing only on the specifics of who was wearing what color hat. In point of fact, over the past 150 years, um, and the anniversary is coming up of the end of the Taiping, Taiping Civil War, um, <laughs> the Taiping Rebellion has been called many things. Its enemies at the time referred to it as the Hair Rebellion because its male adherents wore their forehead hair long by contrast with the rest of the male population of China who shaved their foreheads as required by dynastic fiat. Or they called it the Southern Rebellion because its first adherents originated in China's south. Um, in fact, there's a famous story of um, an encounter whereby um, Li Hongzhang compared notes with Ulysses S. Grant and said that they both had problem with southern rebels. I think I'm getting that story right. I heard it from Steve, and I'm maybe a little iffy, but I, I think I'm remembering that correctly. They also called it the Hongyang Rebellion because two of its most visible leaders were surnamed Hong and Yang. And by extension, it was sometimes called the Red Sheep Rebellion because Hong and Yang sound like the Chinese words for red and sheep. Eyewitnesses called it the Apocalypse, or the Time of Fires and Soldiers. Proponents named their movement first the Society of God Worshippers, and then as they gained momentum, the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, or the Heavenly Kingdom of Great Peace, reflecting not on the irony, but on the utopian terminology of both the Chinese and Christian canon. 
In addition to these names, the event has also been termed the bloodiest civil war in human history. It might also, given the civilian casualties and exterminatory rhetoric employed on both sides, be called a total war. And yet the death and destruction has remained marginal to current understandings of the Taiping in both the United States and China. Um, in the US, the historiography has been mostly concerned with the sort of whether or not the religion subscribed to by the Taiping leader was authentically Christian or not, or was he a madman? Um, whereas the Chinese scholarship has tended to ask the question, to what extent was this revolutionary? Um, my book argues that for the people who lived through these events, the death and destruction were precisely what defined their experience and shaped their choices, both in wartime and in its aftermath. The story of this war has, as I just said, often been told as the biography of a visionary and the proto-revolutionary movement that he inspired. And in order to get us oriented in the moment, here's the basic narrative, sort of the standard line, the historical overview. In 1837, a failed examination candidate by the name of Hong Xiuquan from Guangdong in China's south fell into a trance and experienced strange visions in which he encountered an old man in paradise. In his dream vision, the old man told Hong that he had been chosen to rid the world of demons and gave him a sword. A middle-aged man also appeared in the dream vision and instructed Hong in the extermination of demons. The men in the vision greeted Hong as a kinsman, as a son and a younger brother, respectively. Several years later, Hong came to understand these visions through a Christian tract that he had received from a Christian missionary. And on that basis, he proclaimed himself the second son of the Heavenly Father and thus the younger brother of Jesus Christ, placed on earth to rid the earth of demons and evil spirits that tormented his homeland. Armed with this religious and ideological message, Hong gathered followers and converts, and eventually in 1851, he declared himself the Heavenly King and proclaimed the founding of a new kingdom on earth, the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. This was an act tantamount to secession, the declaration of a capital proclaiming himself ruler, etc. And it established a hostile territorial polity within the Qing Empire, making what follows a civil war by any conventional definition. The heavenly king assumed imperial prerogatives even as he launched anti-state military campaigns. The rebel forces fought their way north, battling against imperial troops and local militias. In 1853, they cap captured the historic city of Nanjing and made it their capital. In spite of a series of strategic missteps and fratricidal internecine conflict, the Taiping forces managed to occupy much of the lower Yangtze River Valley in 1860. That would be the area, including major cities like Hangzhou and Suzhou. Ironically, their defeat of imperial forces in the vicinity of Nanjing in 1860 forced the dynasty to delegate more military and political authority to the Hunan Army, a regional army constituted for the purpose of fighting the Taiping. It was organized by a man named Zhang Guofan. And later, also another regional army, the Anhui Army, led by Li Hongzhang. Hunan Army forces ultimately defeated the Taiping by occupying their capital in 1864 in July. Hong Xiuquan's suicide prior to the city's reconquest and the capture and execution of his young successor and most of his generals meant that the war effectively ended with the fall of the Taiping capital, at least in military terms. Efforts to rebuild ruined cities, bury and commemorate the dead, reconstitute shattered institutions, publish lost textual heritage, and restore faith in the Qing regime all posed intractable and persistent challenges for those who sought closure and reconciliation or simply to put the war in the past. Missionary observers at the time estimated 20 to 30 million dead, including civilians. Although we have no way of assessing the accuracy of these numbers, it's clear that the carnage was considerable and probably unprecedented. Local histories from the period, for example, describe population loss of approximately 50% in cities like Suzhou and Hangzhou. A high proportion of wartime deaths were not on the battlefield. They seem to have been caused by starvation, disease, epidemic disease, actually, and suicide, in addition to the direct violence of warfare. Major cities burned. Civilians and soldiers starved and suffered 
Both sides committed atrocities. Killing, capture, pillage, and rape became widespread, especially as funds to arm and feed the armies ran short. Over a period of approximately 14 years, 1851 to 1864, the fighting of this war afflicted 17 of Qing China's 24 provinces, not all at the same time. And it was especially destructive in its end game from 1860 to 1864 in the Yangtze River Valley. Betrayal, loss, terror, and destruction became commonplace. Leaders ca called for the absolute extermination of their enemies. War pitted neighbor against neighbor. It divided families and communities. Um, I said once publicly that it pitted brother against brother, and someone said, Meyer Fong, you've got the wrong civil war. But I actually did see evidence in the primary sources of families where one brother joined the Taiping and the other side joined the local militia. So yes, it was like our civil war, a situation where brothers fought brothers and, and um, neighbors fought neighbors. It left bones and unclaimed corpses scattered across a devastated and defoliated landscape. Ghost stories proliferated in the aftermath of war and ceremonies to placate the war dead continued in some areas almost until the very end of the 19th century. To give a sense of the cataclysmic loss experienced and later recalled by survivors, I offer a quote from the local history of an administrative unit in Anhui province, written not long after the war ended. Quote, in 1860, the rebels penetrated the border of our district, coming and going countless times. Many of the inhabitants suffered and were killed or killed themselves or were captured or starved to death or died in epidemics. Those that died totaled more than half of the population. Those that lived had no way to support themselves. Between 1860 and 1865, the people could not farm, and so they ran out of grain. In the mountains, all of the wild plants were consumed, and people ate each other, which led to the spread of epidemics. There were corpses and skeletons everywhere. The roads were covered with scrub, and for several miles, there was no sign of human life. This was a strange disaster, unprecedented since the beginning of human existence." End quote. This excerpt from a local history is in many respects typical, from the references to corpses, skeletons, and disease, to the disturbing progression from eating wild plants to eating people. References to unprecedented loss and destruction, like the one I've just shared, fill the pages of local histories, memoirs, diaries, and other accounts. These sources describe senses overwhelmed, bloated corpses filling waterways, the sounds of gunfire and of ghosts, and of neighbors wailing, the stench of disease and death, flames slicing the sky, the torment of mosquitoes, persistent and gnawing hunger, anger, sorrow. In a confused world where people were not who and what they appeared, people sought certainty, proof of allegiance, and some surety that the world as it had been could ever be restored, if, even if, from the vantage point of that present, it seemed that it couldn't. These sources, moreover, suggest that this was a hard-fought and confusing war fought by a shifting array of militias, bandits, captives, mercenaries, and regional armies, many of whom proved to be ambivalent and unreliable allies. War occasioned moral, social, and political confusion and commanded renewed clarification. War undermined dynastic legitimacy because of poor governance, widespread corruption, disastrous military performance. <coughs> And paradoxi paradoxically, war called forth intensified expressions of loyalty to the dynasty in its aftermath. Wartime loss, at least in the short run, gave rise to a longing for dynastic renewal. Later, lingering doubts from the war, compounded by ongoing poor governance and corruption, gave rise to revolution in 1911 and again in 1949. And in both cases, revolutionary leaders embraced the Taiping revolutionary movement as both model and antecedent. Because this war was embraced as a key node in revolutionary history, both by those who overthrew the Qing and by those who won China's mid-20th century civil war, in China, the story of the Taiping revolutionary movement was subsumed into a moral and political narrative that emphasized revolutionary priorities over individual and collective suffering. In the West, the story has tended to be told as the peculiar story of Hong Xiuquan, a failed examination candidate who had a beef against the dynasty and who believed he was the younger brother of Jesus Christ. 
Thus, even after years of studying history, Chinese history, my lectures on this period, and I confess this publicly, tended to focus on the odd religious element of the story. And as I progressed in my research on this book, my perspective changed completely. I've tried, I, and actually I felt really terrible about this, like thinking back on the way I used to lecture and realizing that I would be like, 20 million people died, but he thought he was Jesus Christ's younger brother. Isn't that cool? I mean, it was just awful. I felt really <laughs> appalled at myself. I'm sorry. Um, it's not really that funny. But anyway, as I pursued my research, my perspective changed, and I decided to focus not on visionaries, generals, and officials, but rather on how relatively less nationally prominent people coped with the effects of war in their hometowns. My book is really about the impact of civil war on civilian society and about the mismatch between the abject way in which this war was experienced and the heroic language through which it was eventually commemorated. In short, the book is about loss unrequited, sacrifices on both sides unremembered, and emotions deeply sublimated. It offers a chorus of stories about individual and collective suffering and local responses to war and reconstruction grounded in a wide range of primary sources. It was a hard book to write because of the subject matter, but because of the subject matter, it felt to me like an urgently important book to write. I'd like to use my remaining time to tell you a little bit more about the book, what I hoped it would accomplish, and what I think it brings to our understanding of mid-19th century Chinese events. I'd also like us to think about what the events described in the book mean if considered in relation to or as context for China's 20th century history of collective violence, personal suffering, and loss. Um, I was asked in China this summer um, how I compared the Taiping Rebellion to um, late dynastic episodes of rebellion dating back to the Han Dynasty, and I said that I hadn't really considered that question because I was really busy thinking about it as a prelude to the 20th century rather than as a coda to a litany of late dynastic um, rebellions. But I, I don't really have an answer to that question, but it's something that lingers in my mind. Perhaps we should also consider what we gain by reframing the Taiping revolutionary movement as a civil war like other civil wars and comparing it across cultures and across time. My book draws upon published and manuscript sources, including diaries, martyrologies, administrative documents, poetry, morality books, biographies, religious tracts, legal texts, foreign diplomatic dispatches and missionary reports, official and unofficial histories, and memoirs. Some of these seemingly have not been read at all in 150 years. What use, for example, are the many, many martyrologies purporting to honor the dead um, on the Qing side after revolutionaries rendered, sorry, after revolutions rendered the dynasty itself obsolete. So why bother reading lists of people who died for a dynasty if the dynasty itself is dead? The post-war impulse to name and enumerate the dead and their mode of dying seems to have died with the dynasty. Although shrines honoring the war dead were deliberately repurposed to honor the revolutionary martyrs of 1911. Others of these sources have been reprinted and loudly criticized in the Chinese historiography for being hopelessly pro-Qing. But in general, in this context, in spite of the accusations of pro-Qing bias, elitism and localism actually seemed more prevalent as reasons for anti-Taiping statements. In other words, it's not that they're pro-Qing, it's that they're anti-Taiping and so they get classified as pro-Qing even though between the lines you can often find criticism of the dynasty, almost more criticism of the dynasty in material that's classified as pro-Qing in some cases. Many sources deride the Taiping as vulgar outsiders. Such sources were just as likely, however, to criticize the dynasty for its atrocities and destruction and for the failures of government officials who were widely understood to have contributed to the conflict. In the course of my research, I found myself particularly troubled or haunted by particular stories, and I sought especially to include these in my book, since they seemed especially absent from our understanding of the war. These spoke especially to my sense of the rhythms of ordinary life disrupted. For example, a seven-year-old boy who suffered through the siege and occupation of his hometown, dimly aware of cannibalism and inflation, only to witness his mother's murder, her decapitation by a Taiping soldier in front of her family, 
and the loss of many of his relatives and siblings. His brothers were captured um, or killed. His sisters committed suicide. The spirit of one of his sisters returned and spoke to him through the body of his father's concubine and reassured the family that she had died well and was worthy of commemoration. Haunted decades later, he composed poems in memory of his mother and then lost them before they could be published. He built a garden in which he claimed he could see his mother's presence and he then lost the garden in a real estate dispute with her relatives. He saw his mother's form on the figure of his maids and he recognized her face in the expression of his wife. He longed for childhood intimacy. He describes longing to lie on his mother's lap and be called by his childhood nickname. The world he inhabited with his mother and his siblings could not be restored even as it lingered before his eyes conjured by his heart. In other stories, a man whose grandmother was anxious that he might suffer from cold feet made him felt socks so that he would stay warm as he went off to war and later his corpse was identified because it was only identifiable because of the socks. Um, another man burned beyond recognition was found and covertly buried by a friend who recognized a scrap fabric from his vest. A merchant in Taiping territory needed to go to Shanghai and thus had to shave his forehead in order to cross into Taiping territory, uh, sorry, cross out of Taiping territory into Qing territory. In order to return to Taiping territory, he had to go into hiding in order to grow his hair out again. Otherwise, his life would be forfeit. Taiping disguised themselves as civilians, bringing soy sauce and provisions to the Qing Navy and tossed incendiaries and explosives at the sails, causing the boats to go up in flames. Bandits impersonated rebels, militias, and Qing soldiers in order to rob pawn shops and steal boats. Refugees sought protection by disguising themselves as beggars. Conscripts had the name of the Taiping regime forcibly tattooed on their faces. Diarists reported fluctuations in the price of human flesh as food. A woman and her young children accompanied her husband's coffin across a war zone to bring his remains back to his parents, whom she had never before met in person. A writer recalled streets piled high with corpses and his tormented travels among the anonymous dead. Another remembered charred corpses bound to the trunks of leafless trees. They had been burned as retribution for failing to produce valuables upon demand. A member of the British consular staff reported in 1861, quote, the same sad story everywhere suggested itself. Devastation marked our journey. The land on either side of the Grand Canal was waste to the, distan was waste to the distance of a mile from the bank, while the towing path, which is also the Grand Rebel Highway, was like an upturned churchyard. Human remains were lying all about in all directions, and if the towing path yet shows signs of the slaughter, the waters of the canal conceal the remains of by far the greater number of victims. The abject image of China's most prosperous region laid waste, its waterways filled with corpses and roads covered with bones, insistently counters descriptions of Taiping Revolution or Qing Restoration. The erasure of these images from the conventional accounts of this period foreshadows the repeated suppression of painful memories and incidences of mass, mass death under the imperative of national narratives that require strategic and deliberate acts of forgetting. I'm thinking when I say this specifically of the three bad years of man-made famine that followed the Great Leap Forward and of the Cultural Revolution as only the most obvious examples. To begin winding down, I'm often asked why my subtitle is coming to terms with civil war. Why not use the word Taiping in the title? Wouldn't that help clarify what this is about? As a colleague reminded me, people who know the period know that it's about the Taiping, and those who don't won't be helped by the word. And with all of the problems of nomenclature alluded to at the outset, do I call it rebellion? Do I call it, you know, what do I call it? The Taiping what? And so it seemed to me that I didn't get that much mileage out of using a problematic name, and that there was much more to be gained explicitly by turning the conversation to the issue of civil war. When we as Americans think of war in the 19th century, we think reflexively about the American Civil War. Certainly few conflicts have generated more scholarship in the English language, more programs for the History Channel, or more weekend reenactments than the American Civil War. The American Civil War continues to attract both popular and scholarly attention because of its lingering political implications. It's larger than life, 
political and military figures and the echoes of insistently reinscribed regional and political identities. With regard to the question of nomenclature, the politics of naming and how what we call an event can reflect or even shape what we think about it, this is also quite salient with regard to the American Civil War. What names do we use for it after all? Relatively few Americans are aware, however, that China had a civil war that was almost exactly contemporaneous with our own civil war, a war also characterized by larger than life political and military figures, by moral complexity, ideological conflict, regional affinities, and lingering political implications. Although to my knowledge, there are not yet weekend reenactors. Um, there, are, there are movies. TV shows, advice books, and museums reflecting current popular interest in these events. And we can talk about why there's renewed popular interest in the period in China today, and maybe why actually there's diminished state interest in the Taiping and diminished academic interest in the Taiping. By highlighting connections and possible comparisons with the American case, I thought I could reflect, for example, on the ways in which mass death transformed the very idea of death, as Drew Gilpinfaust of Harvard has suggested for the US Civil War. This, as she notes, had transformative implications for how Americans conceived of their relationship to their families, their religion, and to the state. And I think the same might be said for the Chinese case as well. For the purposes of my book, I wanted readers to think of these events as China's mid-19th century civil war and explore the conclusions that would result from this change in terminology. When we think of the Taiping period as civil war rather than revolutionary movement, we gain access to a whole new set of questions. First of all, we're no longer as bound to the very limited number of surviving sources on the Taiping side, and we're open to explore a huge range of untouched source material. The shift in nomenclature doesn't mean that we unquestioningly conclude that the dynasty was the good guys, although, I mean, that might be tempting. Uh, by the time I finished this book, I thought they were all a rotten bunch. Of <laughs> um, sorry. I mean, I really, by the end of the book, I just felt like the Chinese people deserved so much better. Um, rather, with a shift in nomenclature, by relabeling the box civil war rather than rebellion or revolution, we're forced to read the sources for what they tell us about the experiences of civilians in wartime. It means that we look for insight into the culture and ideologies of the times that produced them rather than the times they produced. And we keep our eyes open for the ways in which these materials are less straightforward than they initially appear. We keep our eyes open for outliers, for odd bits of information that tell stories that defy our expectations. Diaries categorized by an archivist as representing a Qing perspective turn out to tell us more about the perfidy and corruption of Qing officials than we anticipate. We watch out for accounts or the places in accounts that detail the everyday experience of war without reference to an ideological agenda. From one angle, of course, we see the righteous martyrs resisting rebels unto death and standing up for a polity and value system that we no longer respect. Or we see revolutionaries with a land tenure system and gender ideology that ostensibly anticipate 20th century ideals. But from another angle, we can see suffering, loss, damage, and death, and the shattering of the very human relationships that we also value and which give meaning to our lives as well. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Much to think about and perhaps to question. Anybody want to begin? Helena? What is an advice book about <laughs> the time <laughs> period? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's actually about Zongguo Fan. So it's like a chicken, how, how to survive in business by emulating the te techniques of Zhang Guofan. Yeah, he's become kind of a touchstone figure for genres of, of, um, of books. I mean, he's a kind of interesting figure because he's still sort of denigrated as a race trader, but then he also gets celebrated as a brilliant strategist who has something to offer to the aspiring businessman. How did, and because he basically advocates a Confucian approach to leadership um, based on a particular form of relationships with one's underlings, and this is seen as offering a model for people today. So yeah, that's... 
Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Please identify yourself. Mayor. Yeah. <laughs> you. Okay. I'm uh, Ethan Kramer Flood. I'm from the Conference Sports China program. Um, it was interesting to hear you talk about how uh, people maybe have exaggerated the religious aspect of the movement, and that begs the question in my mind if, if it's true that all the, the preaching was um, of limited ultimate significance, then what motivated the millions of people to join? What, what was going on that would make these brothers choose opposite sides? Mm. I mean, if, it, if it didn't mm. have anything to do with this system, then why? And if it was purely um, Instrumental. resistance to the Qing, um, then, it, then it does fit into this, this cyclical narrative of, of you know, end of dynasty, the people just want to get rid of them. That's, that a, all was. that's a really good question. I don't mean to minimize the religious commitment of the Taiping and their adherents, especially not the people who joined initially in Guangxi, who may well have been sincere believers. I just mean that in looking at this period, there's something to be gained by doing something other than reading the limited number of surviving Taiping religious texts and attempting to analyze whether or not they were authentically Christian, which is a, a project that has been widely engaged ever since the mid 19th century. So I don't mean to say religion is irrelevant to the story. Um, I'm trying to say that historiographically we have something to be gained by broadening the field of questions we asked um, and that regardless of whether um, the whether first of all the Taiping movement at the outset I think attracted a community but I, there's been a tendency to read the Taiping and all of their followers as necessarily being that core group of committed either revolutionaries or religious fanatics or however people define them but in point of fact, the movement grew and gained adherence for a whole range of other reasons, um, including mercenaries, including captives, including people who switched sides. Um, and so by, the by 1860, it's an incredibly messy assortment of armies doing the fighting. Um, if you look at the from the vantage point of their initial uprising in 1851, you could say that's an uprising a religiously inspired uprising. Jiangnan from 1860 to 1864, that's definitely civil war, from my perspective. Um, but the, it's a good question. Another issue that I address in the book is the possibility that um, adherents on the Qing side also had a kind of re orthodox religious um, awakening, that Confucianism also changed in its religious content um, as a result of responding to the Taiping. And, you know, it seems to be human nature to Identify try to... Identify yourself, Oh, please. I'm sorry, Bryce Kirkland Rodriguez. Uh, it seems to be human nature to uh, you know, try to attribute right or wrong in, in a conflict. And it, it sounds as though the religious uprising, if you will, might have been catalyst. But at some point, uh, it almost seems as though conflict hardens positions on both sides and, and the the catalyst no longer matters as much, nor is it, you know, does it define any right or wrong. So is that a path we're headed toward with Syria? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm a Qing historian. Yeah. I may be a public intellectual, but I think <laughs> that's a really interesting question. And certainly when I look at the Syrian case and I think about our those responsible for making decisions. I am grateful that I'm not making decisions because it seems to me that it's very hard to identify and know in the long run who you invest. I mean, like, for example, I mean, to give you a historical parallel, um, Stephen Platt has done really excellent work considering the question of why the British, who fought the Second Opium War against the Qing in North China in 1860, jumped in on the side of the Taiping, uh, sorry, jumped in on the side of the dynasty rather than on the side of the Qing the very Taiping. shortly Taiping. thereafter. Taiping. What? Mm -hmm. Fighting? Hmm? Rather than on the side, side of the Taiping. Taiping. Right, rather than on the Taiping. Mm -hmm. And there were debates in London, you know, the Taiping represent a kind of, 
anti-Manchu nationalism, that they have revolutionary and modernizing potential, they might be better for trade, and ultimately they come in on the Qing because they have treaty agreements with the Qing. And I, I think, wow, you know, from miles away, you know, you, the, the issues being debated and decided are, are very much abstracted. Um, and also the process of making the decision, who you bet on, uh, and, and how it all turns out seems deeply historically contingent and you often run into sort of unexpected outcomes. So, um, yeah, I'm glad I'm, I'm glad I'm a historian and, 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 and my capacity to make predictions is not really on the line. But certainly I think it offers a, a useful historical example of the sheer messiness and um, of, of, of human behavior on the ground. Frank? Frank Kale, uh, United States China Exchanges. I'm conflicted as between two questions. I'm going to put two out and you choose. All right. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the in your book the different views officially of the Taiping, revolutionary or reactionary, etc. Um, and the question here would be, uh, has that had a significant change let's say starting from the Deng Xiaoping era versus before. The other question, I'm always interested in the anonymous dead. The who? The anonymous dead. Ah. Mm -hmm. I did a, uh, a documentary called Hungry Ghosts, and I'm guessing that there was an enormous ritual outpouring in, in a situation of the kind of carnage that you described. Mm -hmm. So my question there is, in, your, in the records you, you looked at, how long does that persist down into the 19th century and does it continue into the 20th century? Answer both of <laughs> They're both really excellent and interesting questions. One way to think about your first question is sort of how has the official view of the Taiping changed over time, particularly in the age of reform and opening up? It's a great question. If you, and I think I'm going to use some monuments as a way of thinking about it. So if you visit Beijing and you go to the Monument to the People's Heroes on Tiananmen Square, the, it has images from the history of the Chinese Revolution on friezes on the sides. And one of the first friezes is obviously the Opium War. The second one is the Taiping Rebellion. And it's sort of codified as one of the most important events in modern Chinese history, one of the foundational events in modern Chinese history. And the official verdict on the Taiping is that it was anti-feudal and anti-imperialist, and it was also feminist. So there's a lot of reason, you know, and, and it also anticipates revolutionary land reform. And it is the subject of numerous, um, was, uh, it, it, it is the probably one of the top three most extensively studied subjects in Chinese history over the course of the 20th century. Um, and it is necessarily evaluated favorably. And there are a large number of research institutions and publications dedicated to the topic, and um, including a museum and research center in the former Taiping capital of Nanjing, the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom Historical Museum near the Confucius Temple um, in Nanjing. The museum was founded in the 1950s, celebrated the Taiping movement. It underwent extensive renovations in 2000, um, and the exhibit design has you know, was recognized with, with an award for um, modern scientific exhibition techniques. And the, sub, the theme pursued in the kind of exhibition narrative is that the Taiping were not only anti-imperialist, anti-feudal revolutionaries, they also were reformers and modernizers. So there's a new message added to the mix. So they not only anticipate Mao, they also anticipate Deng. And you know, there's a, a wall of kind of praise for the Taiping, um, Marx, Mao, Guomo Ruo, and others on this wall of great, oh, Sun Yat-sen, 
and I mentioned Marx. Anyway, lots of very famous people and their quotes about the Taiping and a lot of material remainders that are associated with the Taiping. And then there's one room that shows Nanjing after the battle that brought about the end of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. And it's this kind of waste, ex defoliated landscape with dead trees and cannons. And it's kind of, it has this really dismal, morbid feeling. And I think it's a reminder of the danger of chaos. Um, in 2000, and the year prior to 2010, if you bought a ticket to the museum, you walked around across the courtyard, and you went straight in, and you toured the exhibit. Um, and you were kind of vaguely aware that there was a famous garden adjacent where, which had been rented out to serve as a, a restaurant. But it wasn't part of the museum. And since 2010, the, muse the um, garden has expanded considerably. And your admission ticket now buys you admission to the museum and the garden. And there's an, uh, a Qing Dynasty Yamen, an official offices, you know, official offices, because the garden had been associated with official offices, and an exhibit celebrating all of the famous officials who had gathered and written poetry and done paintings on the site. And the kind of narrative there is glorious age, glorious part. Wait, glorious age, glorious parties, and I'm forgetting what and and glorious garden or something like that. I can't remember what the third thing was. But the idea is that in an era of cultural, uh, an era of great prosperity and cultural flourishing, and a kind of presentation of um, the Qing in much more positive light than previously. Not the Qing of the Taiping era, era mind you, but the Qing of the glorious age of the Qianlong era. And Qianlong has become a kind of favored um, figure in contemporary historicization. So perspective on the Taiping, um, it's now a very sensitive topic. Um, not much academic work because it's seen as a kind of exhausted field, but it, rem it is now officially a politically sensitive topic um, because anti-regime rebellion is a politically sensitive topic. Um, even if it spawned a revolutionary movement that legitimizes the regime. So it's a complicated rhetorical move. And so I think the positioning, of, the expansion of the garden and celebration of the glorious age of dynastic power alongside the Taiping revolutionary movement um, historical museum seems to be a kind of metaphor for the conflicted party relationship to the revolutionary and dynastic past. Um, as for the anonymous dead, how long were they, um, how long did they carry out rituals to palliate the dead? Um, almost to the very end of the century, um, state-sponsored, state-sponsored, locally-initiated efforts to identify the loyal and righteous dead continued um, through the 1890s. But there are kind of hints that the state-sponsored rituals were not considered to be particularly efficacious. So local elites hired in 18, I believe it was 1887, if I'm remembering correctly, hired Buddhist monks to carry out rituals, um, a sui lu chang, like a, a, a ritual to, I'm losing my words, um, rituals to comfort all of the ward, all, all of the dead who died violently. It's a kind of ritual to carry, to, to comfort the souls of the dead who died violently, and so there's Buddhist, it's a Buddhist. As to it's it's a Buddhist rite, and it's carried out on the grounds of the officially sponsored um, shrine commemorating the martyrs in Zhejiang, in the city of Hangzhou, in 1887. Um, there were also a lot of ghost stories about the unquiet dead that remained current through the end of the dynasty.
Um, what's interesting is the extent to which after 1898, interest in that sort of the, the rhetoric on the Taiping shifts very quickly. And so in writings from the late 1890s, you start to see accounts of Zheng Guofan as race traitor and the Taiping as anti-dynastic, anti-Manchu heroes. So it kind of flips. And then in 1911, those very same shrines honoring the war dead are converted to shrines honoring the revolutionary martyrs of 1911. Charles Wong here. Would you uh, care to elaborate how much anti-foreign aspect of the whole movement when it first started. I think it, it catch on uh, with a lot of popular, popularity because of the anti-foreign uh, and the nationalistic kind of uh, preaching. Do you mean anti-foreign as in anti-Western or anti-Manchu? Anti yeah. <laughs> they were, from the typing sources that I've looked at, they're more preoccupied with being anti-Manchu than they are with being anti-Western. Um, the boxers of 1900 are explicitly anti-Western. The Taiping are sometimes represented in Chinese historiography as being anti-Western, but their real preoccupation is eliminating the demons, and by demons they mean the Qing. Along the lines of, of his last question, does um, I oh, sorry, Evan Winston, um, does the the carnage that's associated with the religious aspect of the revolution uh, leave a long term stain on Christianity up into the twentieth? That's century? a really great question. Yes, um, there. Yes, in terms of. The same publishing houses that were involved in sort of publishing. Uh, certain types of response to the Taiping then begin. Let me, I'm trying to think. There's some anti Western, anti Christian tracts on the Qing side um, that definitely reflect a kind of those Taiping and the Western. Yeah, absolutely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. I'm curious also, does the Vatican take a stance on this while it's happening? I don't know. You'd have to ask Steve. <laughs> the, actually, they were much. The Taiping are of much greater interest to Protestant. In in my reading, the Protestants are much more interested in the Taiping than the Catholics. Um, they partly because there are a lot of Protestant missionaries roaming around for the first time in China. Uh, well, then along that, did the person who, I forget his name, the person who associated himself with being the second son of God. He got, yes. Did he associate himself with a, a specific tranche of Christianity? I think he saw himself, I mean, I think the Protestants recognized him as a Protestant. How did he recognize himself? I, I'm not, I, you know, I haven't spent enough time with his work. He saw himself as the second son of God. Um, he was very his his cousin Hong Rangan was very he he trained okay Hong Xiaotuan had an affinity for Protestants insofar as he had co contact with Christian missionaries they were Protestant missionaries um, Hong Rangan ex his cousin went to Hong Kong and studied with Protestant missionaries and then traveled from Hong Kong to Nanjing and became an of official within the Taiping establishment and sought to reach out to foreigners, um, to, to Western governments and to missionaries as brother to brother. And then one other question, would the, later in history, would the Japanese in Nanjing, uh, Nanjing, would they have been familiar with what had happened there 56 years before? That's an, I've never thought about whether the Japanese saw themselves as reenacting the same kind of violence that was inflicted on Nanjing. What I have thought about is the extent to which Nanjing has experienced incredible and horrific violence on repeated occasions subsequent to 
I, the initial fall to the Taiping in 1853, the fall to, I mean, Zhang Guofan's forces were absolutely brutal. The atrocities in Nanjing were truly horrific. Um, so I don't know whether the Japanese consciously considered that question, but certainly we as people with access to the information about both instances of mass violence can consider certainly the ways in which Nanjing might be haunted. Um, some years ago, an Italian sociologist by the name of Vittorio Lantanari wrote a book called Religions of the Oppressed, and he covers the Taiping Tenguo. Mm. And simultaneously in Korea, there was a movement called Chungogyo, which is the religion of the heavenly way, which was also anti-dynastic and syncretic, mm -hmm. involving uh, external religious uh, uh, ideology. So the question I'm, I'm thinking of is, have any of your Chinese colleagues who are familiar with the Taiping Tianguo looked at other 19th century anti-establishment explicitly political religious movements? Hmm. My general sense is that the Chinese historiography is more interested in revolutionary content like land reform and uh, feminism than they are in the religious content, whereas the Western scholarship is more interested in the religious content than they are in the revolutionary content. Um, the question of anti-dynastic religious movements in the 19th century is a very interesting comparative question, but it's not one that I've really considered, so I'd hesitate to answer, but it's a really interesting question. Yeah. You've mentioned several times. Who that, are you? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Jan Barris with the National Committee of West China Relations. Uh, you've mentioned the role of feminism several times and how that is important in terms of the government's way of looking at this, or the state's way of looking at this. Can you expand on that more? Were there female generals? Were they camp followers? Campfire girls? No, followers. <laughs> followers, not uh, uh, All right. The Taiping... Okay, the, the kind of line on Taiping... The, the, it's very interesting, the, the kind of for, foreign interest in the Taiping um, in the 19th century sort of has its origins in, 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 in missionary accounts, but one of the areas where of American scholarship where the Taiping feature prominently is a sort of this, not only are they the antecedent of um, modern Chinese revolutionary history, they're also the antecedent of modern Chinese feminism because the Taiping um, preached a gospel of radical egalitarianism um, so men, men and women are equally children of God. Men and women are equal. Um, Taiping women didn't bind. They were Hakka, and they, which is a kind of sub-ethnic group from South China, and they didn't bind their feet. Um, Taiping women um, were, you know, if you're looking for women warriors in the Chinese past, there were, you know, ostensibly. Um, women in the Taiping military, not as camp followers, but as militant women, um, large, actually, actually, supposedly, I, you know, um, they practiced radical sex segregation. So men and women, even if they were married, were required to live separately. That didn't go over very well, um, <laughs> but it, for a time that was practiced. The only men who kept women in their households were the Taiping kings who enjoyed all imperial prerogatives, including large um, fl fleets of <laughs> women, um, cap captured women. They had th their pick. So the question of Taiping feminism, how authentically feminist, is sort of like the how authentically Christian. You could go around and around looking for bits of evidence and trying to add up whether it amounts to feminism. 
The other question is why, you know, if the Taiping represented women's liberation, why was the initial reaction of so many Chinese women to the word that the rebels are coming was to commit suicide? Um, mass suicide by women was actually a, a, a quite prevalent response to the Taiping presence. Um, so, yeah. And, and that's because they were afraid of being captured and used as the yeah. choice of the two kings or, or general? Just widespread, widespread mayhem and chaos engendered a uh, need to avoid shame and loss of chastity and therefore um, you committed suicide. Um, so the question of, I mean, on paper, they look like radical feminists. In practice, the story is more complex um, and messy. Um, yeah. But it, they, but it, it's one of the features that has been very much studied in the Chinese historiography because it's one of the sort of happy parallels between the communists and the Taiping is that they're anti-imperialist, uh, anti, you know, liberators of Chinese women, liber liberating the Chinese people and liberating Chinese women. Um, the Taiping record and the party's record are maybe a little messier and more complex than the um, slogans would suggest. Yes, follow up. <laughs> yes, Jan. It's follow up, though, not to my question, so someone else has it's follow up to write the question. Yes, go ahead. Um, one image that I've taken away from your talk is just how devastating this was on the local level, that communities were just ripped to shreds, to pieces. So my question is, how did local officials and local elites, how did they begin to put it back together again? What were the, their priorities on the local level? I imagine maybe burying bodies was yep. just a priority. What would they do with orphans, food supply? What were some of those just basic concrete steps these poor local officials would take? They probably didn't care if the destruction came from the Taiping or the, or the Qing. They're just right. wondering, how do we rebuild, rebuild and, and deal with tomorrow? That's a good question. Um, the, basically, the war produced an alliance between provincial, local officials, provincial and local officials, and local elites. Um, one of the prevalent responses in the Jiang, what? Oh, sorry. In in <laughs> sorry, in the Jiangnan region was the formation of sort of semi-official, sort of officially sanctioned but elite organized bureaus to undertake. Um, philanthropic activities and the most fundamental was collecting bones and burying them and establishing charitable cemeteries and mass graves but also um, there's a lot of concern with lost textual heritage, lost libraries, lost books and so publishing bureaus under um, carried out by local elites um, th there was a bureau for gathering and investigating the loyal and the righteous. They went around and collected information about people whose deaths might be construed as worthy of official commemoration. Um, there were, um, a f again, bureaus respons responsible for setting up soup kitchens, for taking care of refugees. There were methods for dealing with orphans and widows. So basically local initiatives with some um, official support at the local level to try and pull things back together. We've reached the wishing, witching hour. It is a little after seven, so I will draw us to a close. Thank you very much for an incredibly stimulating talk and discussion. And please, there are a few more copies of the book if you would like to purchase one. We're happy to sell them. Thank you.